Uh, if you don't mind turning with me to Mark 12 from verse 28, we're still in our series about the Holy Spirit, but I guess you can't really talk about the Holy Spirit without talking about the Father, without talking about the Son. We believe in God our Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. So actually, Jesus' answer starts there. This is what is important. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, your, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God. So this is now starting the second part of the answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is now the third part of the answer. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than this. So it seems like Jesus gave him an answer in three parts. So there will be a, bit of, a lot of three by threes here uh, this evening. And then uh, after Rory spoke about what he, what he has seen around the, the city of Pretoria, is that whenever a church moves out of a tent, it seems like the, the Holy Spirit that was so present in the tent and when the church moves into the building, it seems like the Holy Spirit is the first person of the Trinity that, that gets ignored. Every time that the church moves from a tent into a building, the Holy Spirit somehow goes away, goes out. He's probably grieved and he goes. But then when he goes, he goes with the Father and the Son. You can't remain with the, the Holy Spirit gone and then the Father and the Son staying behind. No, that doesn't happen. Amos chapter 7. Verse 7, this is what he showed me. So actually, Amos is sharing a, a, a dream or a vision. This is what the Lord showed me. The Lord was standing with a, a by a wall that had been built through to plumb, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, look, I'm setting a plumb line among, in the midst, at the heart of, of my people Israel, I will spare them no longer. So when I'm reading, I will spare them no longer, actually the theme of Amos comes to light because Amos was talking about the day of the Lord. He's one of the minor prophets, not because he's small, but because he wrote a shorter book, few chapters, and the work was done. So Amos was actually talking about the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is actually the day of judgment. And my wife was telling me, please don't start with judgment. Try and kind of, you know, start with something a bit softer. So I, I don't know if she suggested or I suggested. I said, okay, let us start with testing. But then I remember that I'm actually talking to a crowd that is full of students. So the, the test could be actually more terrifying than the, <laughs> the, the day of judgment. I mean, I remember when I was studying, you know, I wished... Every time that there was a test, I wish that the rapture will, will arrive before the test. And if I was in Pretoria, I was, I was probably going to be practicing my departure, you know, maybe in a helium balloon and looking at everybody else like, you know, if it was in Pretoria, like a uh, uh, manier, sin, sin your lighter, you know. <laughs> I'm gone, you know, you can remain behind with a test, you know. I'm going, but it never happened. You know, we finished with a building, and I'm sure that we had some magnificent architects and, and uh, builders. I'm sure that they came and tested all our walls for, for plumbness. I'm sure, I hope that you can see that. So it's a plumb line. You go and, and, and stand against the wall and see if the wall is actually vertical, if the, the wall is upright. So my, my wife is asking me to, to be a bit higher. It's not me going up, it's my wife asking me to go up. <laughs> you know what? I'd rather go up because I'm, I have to go home. <laughs> so it has to be plumb. Yeah, I'll go up again. Sorry, I'll go up again. But you know, this, this plumb line are there to, to test walls for, for uh, uprightness, but also for stability. 
Because if a wall is upright, it will also be stable. You agree with me, Sander? <laughs> upright, stable. But we also have modern plumb lines. So I'm not going to use this one anymore because we've moved on. This is a modern one. You've probably seen some of, some of these on the side of the road. So, uh, Helen, there's a feedback, so I can't really go up. <laughs> so it's not me, it's a feedback. Yeah, so the cameraman must probably come. I mean, my wife says the cameraman must come. Yeah. <laughs> not me. <laughs> yeah, they say you must marry up, you know, so. <laughs> so, so, this plumb line, you, you, we saw in, in the Bible that actually it was held by the hand of God. Held by the hand of God. You know what, when I'm talking about the hand, in a Hebrew culture, God wasn't separated from his hand. It's only us Westerners, that include myself, that live in compartmentalized kind of mindset. Where people will say, you know what, the money is in my hand, but I didn't take it. Because it's like I'm, a, I'm of good character, it's only that my, the money is in my hand. We separate ourselves from our hand. It seems like the hands are a different person, and I'm, I'm completely different. As they've come with this thing called, you know, uh, lifestyle audit. So it's like, okay, guy, I mean, man, we look at your salary. If there's so much money in your hand and your, sal your salary is so little, you, you, you are a crook. You have stolen. Because what's in your hand is actually in yourself. And the, the father is saying, I'm holding a plumb line because I'm testing something against my hand, but not just my hand, against my character. And look at the plumb line. The plumb line is actually being held. This is a modern one. It is being held by the hand. It's a picture, but actually it's a hand with three legs. If this plumb line had four legs, it would take about an hour to set it up. But because it is three legs, it's actually faster to set it up. I, I, somebody told me that it's actually called a Wasser, water pass. Water pass. So it, it's a test. So there's a father. Obviously, we can't break down the Trinity to a place where we can understand the Trinity, but it, hel it, it is helpful to have pictures. Yeah. So it's like the hand of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we are going to test everything for stability against the character of the hand of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So there's this picture that we have. But also the picture is, should I emphasize two, that's where I wish I actually put it up there, should I emphasize two people in this trinity at the expense of the one, everything will be built out of level. Should I emphasize one at the expense of the two, I mean you get the point, at the expense of the two, the same thing happened. These are the things that we see next to roads. And what, they are not there to, 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 to actually, somebody was telling me that when, whenever I see these things actually slow down. No, they are not, that's not the purpose. <laughs> that's not the purpose. This is something else. And they, they, there's actually more, more and more. I, I, I don't know if the guys are ready to just show some of the picture to, you know, I got these ones from site. I asked my friends on site to send me this one. This is like a, this is, a, this is an entry level. That's kind of an intermediate one. And then there's, a, there's actually the creme de la creme. I was actually saying, you know, this is like a, the Steve Dolenberg type of a... You know why? Because this one here looks at the satellites, the cosmos, to find direction to make sure that there's stability in whatever we are building. The father is saying, we built a building, all going well, but now I'm moving in the midst of my people. I'm going, I've tested the building for stability, which is rigidity for a building, but the contrast is I'm now testing my people for stability. Stability for a building is rigidity. You don't buy a house that, is, that has got walls that are out of plumbness. But also, the father is coming with his water pass against his people and say, are you stable? But you know what is stability for us, the people of God? For Israel is flexibility. 
Walls are meant to be rigid. That's why we have a magnificent building. But the people of God are meant to be flexible. They need to be kind of like the water, like the fire, like the oil. Flexible. That's, that's what God is testing for. You know, why is God testing against flexibility? Because himself is a God of flexibility. Our God is very flexible. And I'm just going to show you a video what we mean by flexibility. This is somewhere around one of my villages. I was sharing this morning that I, I come from a tribe. In fact, I come from, from three tribes. This is another three, three by three. I'm a Lunda. I'm a Minungu. In fact, I lost my, my one of my uncles was a chief, a Minungu chief, but I'm also a Chokwe by, by marriage. I mean, not marriage to Helen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sh she's not Chokwe. It's like, it's just like people ask, you know, who's German in your family? I'm like, no, nah, definitely me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's another three by three. So this young man was actually dancing, and if you realize, he had a loincloth around his waist, and he was dancing. And if you notice, it was actually car washing, and somehow somebody was playing some gospel music, and he forgot that he was washing the car, and he just went into a time of worship. When I saw that person dancing, I can't but imagine, I can't help but imagine and ask myself, what experience of God has he had to such a point that he can just break into a dance whenever he hears gospel music? There must have been something. Not the clothes that he's wearing. It's not the job that he's got. It's just car washing. There must have been something of God that he experienced for, for him to be able to break into a dance like that. Our God is a flexible God. And I brought my, I've got my friends here to actually illustrate that because God is a flexible God. <laughs> Zephaniah. <laughs> Zephaniah uh, 3.17 says that he, he, he actually danced. And he goes into a very extravagant dance where he spins around us. That speaks of flexibility. But then in, in Jeremiah 13, 11, he says that I'm wearing my people Israel like a belt around my waist, like a loincloth. In fact, I'm wearing them like a man that is going, like a man. And when I see like a man wearing a loincloth, the only picture that comes to mind is Psalm 45, the psalm of the, of the wedding. So basically, people went to, to wedding with their weapons, because, I mean, there was no time to go home and actually drop your, we your weapon, because, I mean, you know the, the scripture. The scripture says, when you're invited to a wedding, go. Don't say, I've got to bury my whoever, I've got to drop my weapon, I've got, you just go with your weapon. But then when you get to the wedding, you don't want your weapon to disrupt your dancing. So you put the weapon into the belt. Then you are free, and we're going to show you that. So the father is free. Sorry. The weapon, I don't need it. <laughs> the father is free. I don't know who's the father, who's the son, who's the Holy Spirit, but I mean, you're just going to do a trinity, you know? The father is free. The son is free. The Holy Spirit is free. Where the spirit of freedom is. In fact, where the Holy Spirit is, there is freedom because the Holy Spirit is freedom. The father is freedom. The son is freedom. So it, it helps when you've got a bit of music to to be flexible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> before we get too excited, <laughs> the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit don't just want to enjoy their company by themselves. By grace, they invite us. And we're going to invite Another flexible man? Can I? <laughs> so actually we're going to do it. We, we, we're going to dance. 
and then he's going to be welcome into our midst because that's actually what the Father does. By grace, he, wel- he welcomes us into our midst, to, to, into his midst to actually enjoy what he's doing. So... <laughs> Great. (laughs) Yeah, give them a hand. (laughs) You know what? I think I've got some some candidates for my village. (laughs) People of my village will be so proud. But you know, you know what, I, I, I'm just going to share a picture as well. I, I, I saw this loincloth even in, in the life of Jesus. John 13, Jesus wanted to wash the feet of his disciples. What did he do? Put on a loincloth so that he would be free to serve. And these are our modern weapons. When we actually win our I mean, we we earn our living using all this. These are our weapons, our tools, and everything. But I believe the Father is saying, there's there's sometimes where you just need to put your tool so that you can have the freedom to serve. As a student, as a lawyer, as a doctor, as whoever. Just put the tool. You're not going to, you know, there will be deals and deals and more deals, but... Sometimes we have to put those tools on the belt and actually be free and praise God. You know, did uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm past 50, so sometimes I get this, this type of problems. Nathan, Nathan passed the test. The water pass. He was flexible. Theologian attempted to explain the Trinity and came up with a term called perichoresis. You know, like Rory said last time, you know, if you try to understand the Trinity, you will actually lose your mind. But if you you try not to believe in the Trinity, you will lose your soul. But that doesn't mean that we don't have to try and understand because we have to not understand completely, but at least have a picture so that we can See what is it that the Father is measuring, measuring us against. What is he testing us against? He's testing us not against each other. That's why there's, there's no need for comparison because actually the Father is never going to ask me why you never perform or why you never achieve like so and so. The Father will only ask us why you never achieved what I had set for you to achieve because I will measure you against myself. I will measure you against the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, not against uh, Tom, Dick, and Harry, and Van der Merwe, Willemse, and, and whoever. I will measure you against myself. Kim Teller says, each of the divine person center upon the other. None demand that the other resol- revolves around him. Each voluntarily circles the, the other two, pouring love, delight, and adoration into them. Each person of the Trinity loves, adores, defers to, and rejoices in the other. That creates a dynamic, pulsating dance of joy and love. The earlier leaders of the Greek church had a word for this, perichoresis. Notice our word choreography within it. It means literally to dance or flow around. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they always dance and flow around each other. Somebody actually had another uh, quote. Sam Storms. God created us so that the joy he has in himself might be ours. God doesn't simply think about himself or talk to himself. He enjoys himself. He celebrates with infinite and eternal intensity the beauty of who he is as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we are being created in his image to join the party. Party time. 
3CI, we have a beautiful building. But what is even more beautiful is how we join the party of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and dominate, dominate the dance floor in abandonment of worship and love. You know, when you have experienced something of the word and you have seen it in your life, there is no way that you can step onto the dance floor and not dominate it. You know, awake my soul and sing. I've been into a place where I actually didn't even know that I was suicidal. Su suicidal. I didn't even know. I had to go to a doctor, and she asked me a question. Have you ever thought of actually taking your life away? Only when she asked me, thank God for doctors that are actually in tune with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Only when she asked me that I realized. And you know, I had to speak to my soul. So when you say, awake my soul and sing, it's actually my mind speaking to my soul and I spoke to my soul, I sang and I worship and I worship and I worship until the physical circumstances around me started changing. You know what, when I dance, I don't dance because I'm concerned about who's next to me. I dance because I've had a time where I had to speak to my soul. Speak the word of God to my soul. There was a change and I experienced that change. Such a point that I, I don't even worry. I'm like a boy washing cars with a loincloth around his waist and just going mad. Dominating the dance floor in the love and abandonment because I have experienced that. You know, we read in Mark 12, but actually in Luke 10, verse 27, the experts came, came to Jesus. He was an expert, so he knew that there would be a day of judgment. He knew that there would be a day of testing. So he came to Jesus and actually asked him, what do I have to do? What is that one question that will make me pass the test? Water pass. One, the father answered him. I mean, Jesus answered him in three, basically, a three by three type of an answer. Hear, O Israel, part, first, first, first part of the answer. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hear, O Israel, you are not like the other nations that have got so many other gods. They've got a God of commerce. They've got a God of, of, uh, of uh, procreation. They've got a God of education. They've got a God of the army. You know that the Greek even had a God of thieves, in fact, the God of thieves was also the God of commerce. Because for them, you couldn't do commerce without stealing. <laughs> Hermes. Hermes was the God of commerce and the God of the thieves. Same God. You know what? What's a, what's a distorted picture? Yeah. But the, Jesus is saying to the Israelites, you are not like these other nations. You have one God. And when they heard you have one God, they should have also heard there is one Godhead and the Trinity in the Godhead. Love your God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit with an undivided love, which means you don't put walls amongst or between them. You know, we've put, sometimes we put walls um, between the Father, separating the Father and the Son, or separating the Son and the Holy Spirit, and vice versa. Why? Because of experience. We separate the Father from the Son and the Holy Spirit because, okay, maybe there's been too much hurt, absent Father and, and all that. Therefore, you know what? I'm just going to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit and the Son. We're going to build a wall and leave the Father outside because I'm projecting my hurt of an absent Father on God the Father. Therefore, we'll leave him out. But you know, you know what? It's impossible to leave him out. Sometimes we don't want Jesus because you know what? Jesus is so close. We prefer a God that is distant because a Jesus that is close, you know, you start looking at my finances, you start looking at my sexuality, he will actually tell me to turn the other cheek when I'm actually being hit on, on, the, on the one. But you know what? Jesus is saying, 
Love the Lord your God with an undivided love. With undivided love. In, in actual fact, when you pursue one, you don't end up with that one. You end up with the other and the other. You pursue the Holy Spirit. He actually tells you how to say Abba Father, so you end up with the Father. Amen. You pursue the Father, and then he says, I'll honor my son. You end up with the son. You pursue the son, and then he tells you, I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You come back to the Holy Spirit. You pursue the Holy Spirit. He teaches you about the son. And then you come to the son, and then he tells you, you, you know what? I'm actually going to send somebody else that is going to walk with you as a paracletus. So you come back to the Holy Spirit again. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. It's like a dance. It's a dance. You remember parents? When our children used to make us buy things by actually blackmailing us and saying, you know what, if I don't have this, I'm actually going, you, you're actually the worst parent on earth. You remember this? You remember this? Fidget spin. My kids, I mean our kids. When there's a problem, it's our kids. When there's no problem, you know? I don't know whose kids they are. It's like, <laughs> I was going to say mine, but actually, no. I have to go home. Uh, <laughs> fidget spin. That's perichoresis right there. You pursue one, but actually you end up with the other one. You pursue the other one, the other one, the other one, the other one. They prefer each other. Uh, sorry? Bad illustration. Bad illustration. Second point, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with an undivided love. Love him with all your heart, mind, soul, strength. I'm like three by three. No, this is like four. But actually there's a theologian, Charles Ryder, who says, you know, when you read in Psalm no, no, you know, every time I say Psalm, I actually remember need. And I remember, you know, Rory, it's left something in me now. Psalm. It's, it's with a P and an S, but actually it's Psalm. Yeah. Psalm, what was that again? 23 verse, no, 4 verse 24. It's like if 4 verse 23. It actually says that the heart is the center of life. So actually the heart is connected to the, spur, to the soul, to the strength, and to the mind. So it's actually three. The heart connected to our strength, to our mind, and to our soul. So he's saying, love the Lord your Father with, love the Trinity with an undivided love. In Amos 7 verse 8, the plumb line was actually in the midst of his people, so at the center of his people, the heart that represented the seats of the intellect, the seats of uh, the physical being, also the seat of the psychological being. The heart is actually everything. He's saying, love the Lord your God with everything about yourself. You know, I saw that in, 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 in John 11, verse 35, small verse, shortest verse in the Bible, but we sometimes have difficulties to actually follow that short verse. Jesus came into Lazarus' house, and Lazarus was dead. He knew in his mind that he was going to raise him because he's omniscient. He knew that he had the, the, the mind, he understood that he was omniscient. He knew exactly what was going to happen in the future. He was going to raise him. He also knew that he was omnipotent. He had the strength to raise Lazarus, but he cried. Would you get to a funeral where you know that you have got, you are going to raise a person and you have the power to raise a person, would you cry? But Jesus cried because his mind, his strength, and his soul were actually connected. He didn't come there and say, don't cry. I know what I'm going to do. I have the power to do it. Don't cry, you know. Control your emotions. But he actually cried because he was connected to God through his mind, through his strength, and through his emotion. And the people say, when he cried, not when he came and told them, I've got the power or whatever, whatever, I know I'm going to do it. When he cried, the people say, look at how he loved him. Mm. 
because his soul was connected. You know, something happened in this church when we were building the church. Clint went to do the munga. You know, I saw something of God there. In fact, if you read in Romans 3, or actually Romans 5, verse 3 to 4, it says, suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Character produces hope. Clint suffered on a bicycle for a thousand kilometers, thousand plus, suffered on a bicycle. Loved the Lord, his God, with all his strength, he suffered. So he suffered, but then through his suffering, he bumped into character. You know what is character in, 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 in the Greek? He's somebody who, who has set his mind on something that he's not going to give up because he knew that the church needed a couple of million to finish the building. So even though he was suffering, he loved the Lord with his strength through his suffering. He ended up developing character, didn't give up, didn't give up because the mind was set in finishing the race. And because he pursued character, suffering character, you know what he ended up with? When he came back, when he finished the race, he actually experienced the love of God to such a point that all of us as a church worshipped. He pursued in his strength, in his mind and character, and we worship, which is experience. We experience the love of God when somebody pursues him in his strength and his mind, and then we worship together as a church. But then the, but then the third part of the answer, yo, Big difference when the microphone is straight. <laughs> the third part of the answer was, love your neighbor as yourself. And I'm going to show a video. I'm going to try and finish there. Dying a little bit. Watch the wall. We saw the first wall. I saw a picture of the Holy Spirit being grieved easily when there are wars. It feels as if the Holy Spirit came first time, just stepped over the wall, carried on, no walls. Second time, it's like, you know what? If there's another wall, I'm actually going to stop. The Holy Spirit being grieved by our walls. When, I, when we arrived in Pretoria, I didn't know what was East, Pretoria East and what was Pretoria West. So I went to buy a part for my vehicle, and the guy was in Pretoria East, and he told me, you're not know, going to find this part in Pretoria East. You have to go to Pretoria West. And I'm thinking, East, West, 15 minutes, should be there. <laughs> Type the, enter the, the pin in my GPS, and somehow I took a wrong turn, I don't know, and I drove, and I drove, and I drove, and, and then I realized I went through a tunnel. I had to ask myself, you know, how far is this place that I have to go through a tunnel? <laughs> you know, when I arrived in Pretoria West, then I realized how different Pretoria West is. It was, it was like, you know, as far away as the east is from the west. So I have removed your <laughs> sins for, you know, it was so far. But you know how far? We are from the people just because there's a wall. How far the east is from the west when there's a wall? 
How far my melody is from us when there's a war? And how many times would the Holy Spirit step over the wall? Step over the wall? There'll come a time where he would just say, you know what? When he's grieved, he's grieved with the Father, with the Son, and with the Holy Spirit. I saw something. Maybe ask the band to, to come up. We're going to worship. I saw something this weekend. It was a coronation of the king of the Zulu. I don't know if you knew about it. That there was a, in fact, it's a pre-coronation of the king of the Zulu. But what was so amazing is that there's, there's like a contest. There's a contestation of his kingship. People are saying, no, he shouldn't be the king and all those type of things. But there's one thing that settled his, his kingship. And I know he is going to be coronated as a king. You know what? That, the thing that settled it is the, the army, the Zulu army. They call them Umbuto. They've never been to a war. I mean, in my lifetime, they haven't been to a war. You know, in the days of Shaka, yes, they haven't been to, they haven't been to a war, a war in, my, in my lifetime. But they call them the army. You know why? I've been asking myself, what are they doing? They sing and dance. And you know what they sing about? They sing about the king. And because the Umbuto sang about the king, they, there's 99.9% .9 chance that he is going to be coronated. And you know what they sing about? They basically sing, you know, that you are the elephant. We are the dogs. You are the elephant. We are the dogs. When you, when you speak, we sit down. When, when death comes, we are not afraid. Why? Because you are the elephant. We are the dogs. And they roll down. Basically, they say, we are going to be low, low, and even lower than the ground because you are the elephant, we are the dogs. You are probably looking at me and say, yeah, why do that for a monarch who is a man? In fact, it's not even like England, it's Zulu land, you know? Why do that for a monarch who is a man? But the question that the father is, is, is actually asking us, when there is a contestation about my kingship, are you prepared to do that for me? Are you prepared to roll in the ground and call me Lion of Judah, Amen. the Lion and the Lamb, the Trinitarian God? Are you prepared to exalt me? They are doing it for a man. Are you prepared to exalt me who is higher than any other man? I've got a name that only me knows. Justice and faithful. King of kings. Eternal God, Almighty God, are you prepared to lift me? And how are you going to lift me? By worshiping and by praising you. By actually rolling even in the ground. I will become even more undignified than this when I'm praising the King of kings and the Lord of lords that I have experienced in Jesus' name. Shall we rise and enthrone our King?